Just a heads up in case you're listening to this with your family or friends who are sensitive to curse words, this episode does contain some explicit language. So, let's get to the show. This is Spike Lee. Well, this is a, this is a satire. I mean, as, as Mark Twain showed, you know, a satire is a good way to to look at things in a satirical light. And this film looks at popular culture, the images of African Americans, how they've been used to sell products, stereotypes from the last hundred years. So, as I was writing this film was really at the time, you know, where we're getting ready to go into another millennium, leaving another. I thought it would be a good time to, to look back, look presently, and see where we are, where we might be going in the future. And this is Required Watching, where we watch the most essential films from the list of cinematic influencers and look at them through the lens of learning about filmmaking and how to move forward. I'm your host, Trey Epps, and... Today we're doing things a little bit differently here on Required Watching. We have our very first guest, Colby Mack of the Colby Told Me podcast. I will leave a link in the show notes. Uh, And the things that we're referencing will also be in the show notes. Listen, Colby is a a family member of mine, a friend of mine, but most of all, the most relevant to you is that he's a filmmaker and he's someone who reviews movies all the darn time. And we get into a bit of a heated conversation about this film and what it means in the context of the world that we're living in, as well as filmmaking. So without further ado, please sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation. How's it going, buddy? Yo, 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 what up? It's your boy, Kobe Mac, and it's taken too damn long to chop it up with my quote-unquote best friend on his podcast. So it's about damn time. (laughs) Listen, we're, we're doing it. We're here now. It, it only took a pandemic and some, you know, revolutions to <laughs> to, uh, to get this going, but we're here. We are here, man. We are here. I mean, listen, and we're talking about, what, Bamboozled today? Um, Yeah, Bamboozled, Bamboozled today, even though it came out 20 years ago, um, it still feels as important as ever, especially now. Listen, uh, in case everyone doesn't know what this movie's about, go see it. It's another Spike Lee joint. Uh, and it's about a frustrated African-American TV writer who proposes a blackface minstrel show in protest. He does this in protest, <laughs> but much to his chagrin, it becomes a hit. And I, I think I'm just going to leave it right there. And as we talk about it, we'll learn a little bit more about the film. But just like you said, it it's something that... <laughs> Okay, I'm actually going to take a step back. Kaylin, what, what, what are some of your first thoughts? You, had you seen this before? Have you not seen this? I did not see it. Um, and I was like, damn. You know, I, Spike Lee, I admire his work a lot. Definitely one of my favorite directors, right? Um, his style is very specific, very distinct. But I tried to understand where I was at this time when this film came out. So this was, was it 2000 or 2001? I can't remember. It's 2000, so it's pre-9-11. Pre-9-11, pre- right? High, high definition, yeah. Exactly. So one, pre-9-11 <laughs> means I was in middle school. This was not the type of film that was going to catch my attention. And at that time, Spike Lee was super big in the late 80s, 90s. And I think in the early 2000s, he was in a different point of his career where he still never got – he never got his due. He never got the flowers that, you know, that he justly deserved. And I think he was getting even more experimental with his work. Where yeah, you do the right things, the She's Gotta Have It, the School Days, the Malcolm X, all of those films felt like black essentials, right? Where in yeah. 2000, a lot of households were dealing with other things where some of his films didn't seem as essential. And I feel like a lot of people missed it. And based on the box office, a lot of people missed it. Um, a lot of people missed it. Yeah, that's right. But it is um, one, of, one of, like, I'll say this, it's one of his most important films that I think that I've ever watched. So I never saw it before. And I'm not going to say I regretted it because, I mean, at that point in time, I was, you know, 13, 14 years old. My mind was looking for different things. And I don't think I would have ever, like, really appreciated what I got at that time. I'm definitely appreciative more now that I'm an older man. You you know, I I have a very very different uh, 
thought on this because for me, <laughs> the, the exact opposite. I had the DVD of this in my house. I don't think I saw it in theaters, but I had the DVD. And I can tell you that whatever age I was, which was what, maybe 12 or 13 at the time, uh, I, I, I wasn't like a, I need to see every Spike Lee joint, but something about this, I think it was maybe Tommy Davidson. Maybe it was Jada. Like it, it, like one, the actors brought me mm-hmm. to this. Um, well, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's surprising how big this cast is and yet how little attention this film got. It's, it's kind of mind blowing. I mean, looking back at some of the films that he did before this, uh, like right before this uh, of notes, you have summer of Sam, uh, he he directed uh he got game both of these movies in 1998 uh get on the bus do you remember that film yeah girl six like he was putting okay and, and I'm, I'm leaving things out i'm leaving like tv specials out i'm leaving out music videos like spike lee was everywhere at this time yet this movie would not be on anyone's list of uh of films that need to be seen by him and i I think that's a crime. I think there's a lot of films that he has it that not that they aren't great. I mean, we can all, everyone talks a lot of shit about uh, Quentin Tarantino, but Spike Lee has banger after banger after banger. And I think he needs more attention than what he, than what he has. I think he gets more attention as a person than he does as a filmmaker. Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. And I think that's like, I think that's the kind of um, the 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 gift and the curse of be of having celebrity, right? Um, and being an artist, where sometimes your celebrity can can outshine your art, especially when a lot of Spike Lee's films, if you look at his entire filmography, they have a very pointed perspective, right? And sure, absolutely. For a lot of folks, especially mainstream Hollywood this is something that is uncomfortable for a lot of people to be able to watch. Um, I love it because these films were made for me. And I love that it challenges the status quo. I mean, one, if you are working in Hollywood, you can watch Bamboozled and them feel very, very conflicted <laughs> and very, very comfortable. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? And it's crazy to think like how many parallels there are in this film to what's going on right at this very moment, especially with us working yeah, inside sure. of the entertainment industry. But yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is quite insane how little pub this film has had with the amount of people inside of it. And I think some people, there's, there's a lot of folks that were just turned off by the name of Spike Lee, who already, they already, exactly, they, exactly. They already had their, they already had, they had their heels dug in. They're like, yeah, I'm going to respect him because like, I know a lot of people like him, but his films are for me. Right. Now, now, let me ask you this, because I I have this conversation with friends a lot, and we will talk about the movie, is, uh, like, you said this movie was made for me. Like, this is a Black movie made for Black people, as opposed to a Black movie being made for white people. Green Book is not a Black movie, but that's made for white people. Like, let's... Yeah, that's not that's you that's made what? for the masses. That's not pointed at me as, that's a, a, as a black man. That's a very interesting discussion point in its own, and it's come up recently as this entire movement since the murder of George Floyd, right? And people talking about elevating black and brown voices and want to celebrating black cinema. What is black cinema? You know, I have another podcast. We try to discover that in our own individual ways, and you know, it's funny because um, Spike Lee's newest joint, The Five Bloods, that would be considered black cinema. You have a black creator. In, you know, behind the camera, you have black creatives and storytellers and actors in front of the camera, black producers, stuff like that. With Green Book, like you said, you have a, my opinion, a black co lead, but that's fine, a supporting character. With no, he co-lead. is. No, he, he is. He, he uh, is let's right? not sugarcoat it. He yeah, is. absolutely. And is it a black? Because, I mean, one, the title Green Book is based upon, you know, that. That era in our in our country where essentially there were citizens of this country, African American citizens that were not allowed to patron certain establishments and needed a guide on how to navigate, you know, Jim Crow South, right? That's right. what the Green Book is. That in itself is an, a a we're tr- we're trying to uncover what is the black plight of being in America, right? So on its face, that should be a black film, but when you have a white writer and you have maybe one Af- African-American producer and Octavia Spencer who really like just like was kind of drowned out by everybody and stuff like that. Um, it's right. tough. That is a black film through a white lens. 
What's what's the film? What's the film with? I, and I get a lot of stick for this, but what's the film with Taraji? Uh, Hidden figures. <laughs> Hidden figure. <laughs> same thing. I, it's it's not. It's the exact same thing again. You go three three black women. How is that not a black film made for black people? Like it's it's not made with me in mind. As in, as in, Ooh, it's made say, for say, much say that general... again, because like, I think some people don't understand that. <laughs> it, it's not made with me in mind. It's it, it just isn't this Disney, and not because it's from the studio, but this Disneyfied version of what these incredible women have done for America is insane. And let, let, let's just take a step back. That doesn't mean that I want to see Janelle Monae, who's a modern woman, this, I'm talking about her new film be transported back to slavery to slavery times. <laughs> yeah, uh, Antebellum is very interesting, I, but that is an African American nightmare that some people don't have a tolerance for. Um but and I, and I haven't done enough research into it. I believe there are black and brown voices in charge of how that film came together, right? So I'm going to give a little bit that, more grace to it. I I will I will see it. I I will see it. I I will absolutely see it, but I'm not going to pretend as if the only reason it's on it is on the screen is because it's betraying it's betraying us in those times yet again. Mm-hmm. Look at look I mean I, listen, I I don't have this in front of me, but if you look at the last few films where we were or, or where it got critical praise and recognition, it's not it's not lovebirds. It's not <laughs> I'm not saying lovebirds <laughs> needs to be uh, critically praised, but it's not uncorked. It's not it's not these movies where it shows just people doing what it, it, like I, I, I don't want to say normal movies, but you know, we look at we look at the Duplass brothers and they can throw anything together and we're like, "Oh my god, that was a critical sweetheart, the mumblecore, the the indie darling, the this and the that." But we have uncorked out, which I would say was a fairly good movie i think it was a perfect for, perfect for the netflix platform and nothing like nothing is being said about it yeah um but then again that's also the how do i like to put this right we've been conditioned because of decades in hollywood where white men have been in power they choose to tell the stories that matter most and when those are all the stories you see you accept them as truth and as fact right so there there's a lot more apology to some smaller films that don't get enough shine that come from white creatives because well it's allowed to be right that's all that gets made um so i i get that completely um but i I think this is a perfect segue into into bamboozle. <laughs> I, I think it's a perfect segue. Just to hit us up with a bit of the cast, we have Damon Wayans uh, p- playing Pierre Delacroix, uh, Savion Glover, who was everywhere at this time, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith, Tommy Davidson, Michael Rappaport. Um, and those are our main actors. And I have the, the character names right here. But Damon Wayans, Damon, Damon Wayans plays uh, Pierre Delacroix, and he is... I didn't realize he was a writer. I thought he was some sort of executive in a yeah. in a studio or a network. And he he's been he's you know, he expresses how he's trying to get these highbrow shows on the air and they kind of just get shot down. And Michael Rappaport's character says, I need something black. Like, I, th- I think he almost <laughs> explicitly sl- says, I need something black. Um and, and <laughs> I mean, this it's it's so it's so silly, and I feel I feel embarrassed to have to say this, but I think we all know how this goes. You know, Damon Wayans goes, "I'm going to give you exactly what it is that you want in order to prove you wrong," and he comes up with this idea of putting on a minstrel show or a millennium men- minstrel show and kind of making this event TV more or less. And Michael Rapport is in love with the idea, and here comes uh, Savion Glover's Man Tan, or excuse me, Man Ray is his name. Uh, and Tommy Davison as Womack, who are street performers. And he picks them up and says, we're going to make you the stars of the show. What do you think about this at, at this point of the film? Like, are, are you buying any of this? Are you on board? Are you, like, were you a bit weary? Because this is about the first 30 minutes, maybe. Oh, yeah. I mean, and it gets to it really quick where you get those signature Spike Lee isms that you'll find inside of a lot of his films, right? Um, the you know the gliding, the, you know the uh, the tracking shot and stuff like that, like his signature tracking shot. Uh, the the opening narration of the film and that monologue it's extremely powerful. One, I was like, damn, Damon Wayans is in this movie, okay. And 
<laughs> what starting with his characterization of Pierre Delacroix, it's like, okay, I see exactly what he's doing. He is right. taking these bits and pieces of what it looks like where you have black individuals that essentially want to, in in a different way, coon, right? And appease sure, absolutely. these white masters. And then for a lot of folks that are listening that may understand what cooning is, it's when a self-hating African-American <laughs> plays the fool for a white audience in exchange for the limited social acceptance the latter are willing to give within their racial hierarchy. So you get varying levels of cooning all throughout this film, right? In Pierre's case, this is a man who is educated, has, you know, climbed the corporate ladder, still has to answer to a white boss that callously says that I'm blacker than you. And he, how yeah, he, oh my gosh. And, and, yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. crazy to see how he interacts in, with Michael Rappaport. And I've got an affinity with Michael Rappaport a lot. Um, there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting thing that kind of goes on one in the film itself, but then also as a creative, you being a white man and cast to be in this role, one, you need permission that was given to you by Spike. You need permission from <laughs> your from your co stars and Jada and Jada and you know Damon Wayans and Tommy Davidson and Savion Glover because yeah. you're going to be engaging in a way that can be really really tough, even though it's quote unquote acting right. So that takes a lot. The entire setup of this world. Oh, I see. I've seen this New York before. Like literally, I've, I've <laughs> you and I we've hung out in this New York before. We've seen these 100%. street performers before. Um, so it's completely real. Having lived in New York and worked in LA, these executives exist even the same way. Um, I would have loved to have seen a bit more frustration where we felt like Pierre was at a, a point where he wasn't going to get the respect. And I'm glad that he said it himself. Well, if I'm not going to get what I want, I'm not about to you know, you know, know quit and get nothing. I'm going to make them fire me. I'm glad sure, that was sure. pointed and it was pushed even more. And that's what, it, okay. Yeah. It, it lays out clearly what his goal is to do, to get fired. And I'm going to do it in the way that is completely in his mind saying, this is what you really want. And I'm going to make you eat it till you think, because in his mind, this shouldn't work. And to his chagrin, it does. And I think it's funny is, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's what's lost. I think, I, I think one, one of my only criticisms as a character, I mean, I have many criticisms, but one of my criticisms as a character is that Delacroix goes, you know, I'm doing this to take you down and to take me down. He's trying to kamikaze this whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. But but as the movie goes on and as this becomes a hit, I I don't know. I like his his compass is obviously being being uh, being swayed, but I, I don't get why he's not sticking to his like. We need to not do this. Yeah, uh, we if need there's to a better not balance. We see so much strength in. How like we can see on screen how doing what he's doing is warping what his original intent was. But what I didn't get from the beginning was, are you really unhappy? Like I want I wanted to be a little bit more. Like it should have been like the, the counterbalance in the film should have been more of I'm doing this to make you look stupid, and I'm shocked at how you aren't looking stupid, right? So I wanted more for him, right? And I yeah. feel like, but then that becomes more of what Jada's character is, a Sloan. Right, right, right. I mean, because because we see we do see Damon Wayne's character. He's living in the clock house, which I don't know if you know this. It's it, it's so expensive. It's millions of dollars, right? And we're talking mm -hmm. about we're talking about a TV network doing primetime TV in New York, which almost what was the name of the, what was the, name of the network? Uh, oh, CNS. <laughs> CNS. I really, uh, <laughs> you, you, have you looked up like what does it mean? I'm I'm, cu I'm curious to like. If, oh no, I, I, I haven't. CNS. I, I have a for a network. But, <laughs> Well, just like you were saying about the movie in general, I was like, there's not much online about it. Mm -hmm. There's not much online about this film, even when Spike Lee's talking about for, the film. I was looking for like essays and stuff like that. Like, I am really, really shocked how little there is to it. And that just kind of points to how this really went under the radar. You know, um, it's crazy. Um, so, we're, so. It, th there's also this connection between Man Ray and Tommy Davidson's character Womack, who know Jada Pinkett's character, who's an assistant, if I'm not mistaken, Sloan, and we don't know how they know each other. Like there seems yeah. to be like some real tight, real it, it loose connection. Is. Like somewhere, somewhere along the way, 
the two of these guys got lost, but we don't know where exactly. Uh, uh, you know, they, so they get cast. They just, they're, again, street performers, they're just looking for any kind of money to eat and survive. They're, they're slumming it and staying in this, uh, they're squatting in some random building. Uh, and they offer them, they offer them this opportunity and they go for it. And it's, it's, it's a minstrel show. Like us as an mm-hmm. audience, I think we're told through voiceover as well that we're going to make you, <laughs> we're not, first of all, the, the, the logistics of the show is quite interesting to me. They said, we're going to make you put on blackface the same way they put on blackface back in the day, which is by yep. burning corks in oil and making you do no it clue. on your own. I, I had no clue about that. Um, and the fact that, that Spike wanted to make sure that, that entire process was filmed and you didn't miss anything. Um, it really shows like how much effort they put into doing this, right? Like these white Absolutely. performers in the past, you know, during those vaudeville days, like they, it, it's such a weird choice and they do it in a way that it's, it's, it, it made it look that much more malicious. Um, and the yeah. inner, like the intercutting of the images from the past, I, I think is great. Like it, it's this unique blend of documentary style filmmaking with the narrative. Yeah. I thought it was fantastic. Um, but you know what? I cannot knock Man Ray and Womack for doing what they did. Um, I've been a starving artist and I have been willing to take roles that may not, you know, they, they may not have been great, but you got to eat. So they are, they were not in a position to say no. Um, and you can see Sloan struggling like, yo man, these are two dudes that I know y'all really don't want to do this, but it's the only shot that they got. So, I mean, listen, they, from a filmmaking point of view, Spike Lee has said, I had no ch- like every time they're putting on the the black face, they're crying, and I didn't like, I didn't tell them to cry. They're like they are uh, like wow. the actors, Tommy Davidson and Saban Glover are crying when they. And I think we get two or three occasions where they're putting on black face. Yeah, but they're crying because of this. I mean, there are Damn. moments in this film where I'm like, I don't know how they did this as an actor, but just like you said, I, I understand the idea that like an opportunity is an opportunity. You have to do everything that you can do to, to get an inch, you know? And mm-hmm. who, who are we to get that inch and go, well, I ain't gonna, I, I'm not going to sit here and do the thing that you're hiring me to do. Yeah. Like, Damn, like I, we're, I, we're not sure. The way you said that, I had no idea. I thought that was something that was built in the script, but the fact that they were so overcome with emotion that even in their work, it's like there's that underni- like the under- underlying realism of, wow, what I'm doing is like I'm subjugating myself to do something that I don't want to do. But then at the same time, like that's, that's the crux of this story, right? Because you have the characters themselves regretting. They, they know blackface is wrong, but it's a part of their job. Like, and they cannot say no. Um, to not have that freedom is a part of the oppression, Right. Like and and, and uh, that's what this film is all about. These systemic things that were put in place, and if people can't see them, yo, know, talk to a black person, and they will let you know. That's exactly what this film is doing the entire time. I mean, the fact that a white man feels bold enough to say that we need a black show, we need a blacker show. It's all based off of sure. what he defines as black, not what we do. If you're looking to start a podcast, the best place to start is Anchor. It's free. The creation tools allow you to record and edit the podcast right from your phone or computer. And Anchor will distribute the podcast for you. So you can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Uh, You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. And it's easy to do everything to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hey, just really quickly, every two weeks from this very second until December, we'll be giving away subscriptions to HBO Max, Criterion Collection, or the streaming service Movie. These are great platforms to watch some of the films that we'll be talking about during the show. So all you have to do is subscribe, leave a review, and we'll choose a new winner every two weeks. So get on it. What he defines. Exactly. 
Exactly. And uh, and again, just to speak to the times of this, there was a show on the air. Oh, man, I don't have it. I don't have it. And it was on UPN, which is so disappointing to me because it, for people who are <laughs> too young to remember or not American, UPN was maybe the, one of the only free channels that played black shows. I mean, there's yeah, really I mean, no other way. There's it, no really it was, way the, it was the non-cable, you know, BET at the time. Um, that's where you'd watch Moesha and you'd watch Sister Sister and you watch Girlfriends and you watch, yeah. you know, um, the Parkers and, um, you know, I, I, I watched almost everything on UPM, you know, Homeboys in Outer Space. Yes. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yes. But, but I, see, I, that, I, that, <laughs> that, see, like home, like even Homeboys in Outer Space, which I think, I think Tommy Davidson was in, right? That, yes. Uh, no, not Tommy we're not, taking, uh, I'm not sure. No, it was it was it was the brother. Uh, Alex, it was Ronald. Alex. It was Ronald from um uh, from from a uh, different world, right? It was Ronald from a different world. Sure, and, sure. <laughs> and oh my, it was the big guy who's actually in this movie. Um, he's a he's a he's a talented voice actor. Like if you think of like a black voice oh, in car- yeah. uh, in cartoon, it's him. And this is like one of his like you know very few you know um you know like on screen like live action roles. And really? I love the show because we don't get black sci fi. Um, and I'll say this, they are black characters. It is through a white lens. That was not a black produced show, right? But see, uh, but, but see, exact, exactly. Are you, wait, are you talking about Homeboys in Outer Space? Or are you yes. talking about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Homeboys in Outer Space. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but like, but like, uh, like, that's the point is that like, we got Homeboys in Outer Space. Why couldn't we just be black astronauts? Mm. Like, why, why, why do we need to be Homeboys? Because that's uh, not appealing. Not- it's not, but exactly. Again, that's a show that wasn't meant to be appealing to us. And it doesn't mean that we don't enjoy it, but it was not for us. And yeah. that's a true shame. And, um, and, and folks, when we say it's not for us, it's got to be by us to be for us. Like if you take, um, you know, uh, oh my gosh, gosh, my, my, uh, Rudy Ray Brown, right? And what he did in the black exploitation era, he specifically set out to make films that were for us, and obviously he made them, so they were by us, right? And the white executives that didn't understand what he was doing and then wanted to kind of like, you know, appropriate what that was, or like, hey, how about you change this up and do, no, 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 I'm making this for us. And whatever your idea of what bad is, that's great. This isn't bad for us. It's the same conversation that we get with Tyler Perry. I may have my thoughts about that, but he's very specific about making media by us for us. And I, you can I'd, tell I'd argue that's not for us, but I, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> true, true. Well, I mean, but, but you. But it's undeniable that we patronize his product. Sure, and, absolutely. And we defend his product. And I mean, I'm not going to sit and say like when I saw, you know, um, uh, uh, Medea's family funeral that I didn't laugh. So like I obviously am entertained by it. I don't feel great at the end of it because even though most of us are watching, there's those that don't look like us that are watching and laughing. But they're laughing for the completely wrong reasons. I mean, and 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 this, I think, I think it's a very small part, but uh, but it, but that's in this as well. Oh, where, yeah. uh, oh my gosh! <laughs> the, the art, the depiction of the audience throughout this film, as we get like you know deeper and deeper to the story, it's horrifying. It's it's insane. Like I. Yeah, it, it's absolutely insane. Where are we at in the film? So just to, just to jump along a little bit, there's a bit of an audition process. The film is getting up and running, and we see the likes of like we see we see Most Def, who I yeah. think is a great actor. I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, mm-hmm. We see Most Def. We see, and I forget what the rest of the band, the actual band, is called. I forget. I mean, I think you know the only person that really sticks out. Like, there's a brother that you know was doing Def, um, Def, you know, comedy gym, uh, the Def poetry. Um, I forget the White Brothers Day, but he's also a poet too. Charlie Baltimore. Oh, MC Search. Yeah, Charlie MC Baltimore. Search. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, Charlie Baltimore. Her and that lollipop. You don't understand the crush that I had oh. when this light skin. Oh my gosh. Oh man. Um, yeah, and, <laughs> and, and but she, I completely but, forgot. <laughs> and, and then I and then I watched it last week, and I was like, "Why was I crushing so hard on on Charlie Baltimore?" Because I mean, anyways. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, by the way, MC Search, who's the white guy in the Mau Mau's, the, the group, uh, his his credit is one sixteenth black. Yes, <laughs> which he, I believe he yelled. All black. There's black, black. There's black. There's black. Black. Um, there's one sixteenth black. Mo, there's, there's Joe Black, Mo Black, Double Black, Big Black <laughs> Africa, one sixteenth black. I think it's hilarious. It's it's hilarious. It hilarious. And 
um, so we get we, we get the M. Oh my gosh! So as far as as far as gags kind of coming back around, or jo- I'm not sure if I would call it a gag, but it's not really a gag. Uh, the actor's name is Thomas Jefferson. Uh, sorry, where is it? Thomas Jefferson Bird, who plays Honeycut. He's the, he's the he's a comedian who is auditioning another okay. guy. He's an older guy. He is a I think I think he comes on stage and he's like, "I'll do whatever you want." Yes, like literally putting out there, "I'll do whatever it is that you want me to do. I'll sing. I'll make jokes. Uh, I, I, I even have the song that I'm working on." And when he's in full full uh, uh, like, what is it? Abe Lincoln. Yeah, with the Abe hat, Lincoln. Hat and everything. Yeah, Abe Lincoln costume and blackface and everything. He's going around the audience later on in the film and talking up and talking to everyone. And, and and the thing he says, niggas is a beautiful thing. It's a be- it's a beautiful thing. He said he says it during his audition, and then it comes back around later on in the film where everyone's in blackface. Everyone, black, white, and in between. Everyone's in blackface, and everyone's saying it. And it's such, it's such, it honestly brought a tear to my eye because I was like, how in the world, how in the world have we come to this, right? Yeah. Yet, yet, everyone's, everyone's wearing, wearing kente cloth. Everyone's, everyone's throwing a fist up in the air. Everyone's listening to rap music and taking our culture and everything else. So like, to, to, to look at to look at that ending moment, and I'm sorry I did skip right to the end, but to look at that ending moment where everyone's in blackface, loving everything that is quote unquote black, and looking at us today and saying, "Oh, that's just a movie," I, I, I couldn't I couldn't do that. Yeah, I mean, because one, I mean, think about what movies are. Movies are essentially you know art imitating life, or supposed to be a reflection of society. Um, think about how little has changed in 20 years. It may not be as a vote as a overt as what the film is, but it's there. I mean, think about it right now. In the midst of civil unrest, um, because of the unjust murder of George Floyd, you have opportunists, social influencers, putting on blackface to show their solidarity, you know, with Black America. One, we didn't ask you to do this. Two, you're completely missing the point. Three, what you're doing is entirely the point, right? You know, I, I think it's Absolutely. great that um, Paul Mooney's character, uh, who is Pierre's father in this film, says, everybody want to be black, but don't want to be black. And yeah. the thing is, for us, myself and Trey, we can't choose when not to be black. Your privilege allows you to choose to be black, right? Like, that's the thing that this, that, that this movie shows. Like, there's so many varying messages throughout this film that are extremely powerful um, that honestly you can dissect this film. Like I, I, I feel, I feel convicted to like try to write like a couple of different essays on it because there's so much here. If you think of how layered what Jordan Peele did with us, this is equally as much, oh, it feels so I, much more overt, absolutely. but it, there's so much truth to all of this, right? Like it, it's crazy. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, there, there's another quote. I mean, this this movie is so quotable. Quotable oh in so many ways. I got so much stuff not, down. <laughs> not to white people, but quotable to anyone who's black. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, there's a, there's a woman who comes in. I think she's a writer or something like this. She goes, "I happen to have a master's degree in African American studies." And Pierre goes, "So you fucked a nigger in college?" <laughs> 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 Which I think was hilarious. I thought it was hilarious. It is because no, it's, how how, how <laughs> How, like how many times do we justify overstepping the line because of something else? Like, right? We like we we go. Oh, like I I can do this. I can say this because X, Y, and Z. Like you said, I'm in support of I'm in support of black culture and black lives. Therefore, I can put on black blackface. That's yeah. not how it works. Um, again, let's take a step back. This is getting uh, way too political for my taste. Uh, <laughs> um. So, Spike, so another movie that I reviewed, which should be releasing next week, if I'm not mistaken, is Network. Uh, and it's, it's if you looked at these two movies, have you seen Network? I have not. I'm familiar with it, but I haven't seen it. So if you, uh, these movies are almost exactly the same. And, and I mean, okay, the, the specifics are definitely different, but these movies are almost exactly the same in that it is about 
like bamboozled focuses a lot more on the people that are meant to be in front of the screen when network focuses a lot more on the network aspect of mm-hmm. it's essentially about a man who's going crazy threatens to threatens to or mental health issues i won't say he's crazy says he's going to uh kill himself on air and because of the because of the ratings and everything else the network's like okay you can go back on the air and it's because of the network's greed it kind of just drives the movie forward mm. um but one of the best speeches is uh one of the best speeches kind of played in this and I, I usually don't say the N-word, and I said it once already, but uh, uh, Man Ray, I think in the first episode of, of the show within Bamboozled, goes, I'm sick and tired of being a nigger, and I, and I just can't take it anymore. He says, go out, go, go to the window, shout it out from the rooftops. I'm sick and tired of being a nigger, and I just can't take it anymore. And it's a nod to this film network, but how like how that resonated in me where i was just like i just want to tell you that i i am not just my skin color i am not whatever it is that you see me as and i I think yeah and i feel like there was definitely a hard r on the end of this (laughs) but (laughs) and it's weird because you know the 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 network inside of bamboozled right they're never they're pretty resolute in their decision and they feel right. emboldened because of Pierre's choice to kind of, you know, they're the ones that pitch this, right? And Sloan is trying to be the counterbalance to Pierre. And it's like, sure. well, can't this be deemed as racist? And then you've got <laughs> you've got a, a Michael Rappaport's character saying, well, it can't be racist, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's yeah, coming it from It can't be racist. Person. It can't <laughs> be racist, you know? Um, the show can't be racist because you're black. And like, just be, like one... Uh, there's varying degrees of racism and the term is, has been very complex. And I'm glad that there's been recent changes to the Webster's definition, uh, Webster's uh, d- dictionary definition of it. Um, but like, it, it's like, that's where so many folks are wrong. And I, I think that's how they try to like, you know, pacify like certain, you know, the things that are like, you know, done in real life. And this, this film really does a great job at trying to pick all of those, you know, different elements, like how more and more, Pierre becomes the grateful Negro, right? He's been given something more than and, uh, than others and forgets where he's come from. And he's called out for, you know, like a lot. He even says, you know, um, do you, rem-? and he's being told like, do you remember me? And he's having these nightmares where a dancing mantan, right? Uh, the, the, the little <laughs> coin bank is coming to light. Yeah. And let me tell you something. One of the, the creepiest things I've ever seen on screen was in, um, Oh goodness! Uh, 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 Tales from the Hood, and if you're unfamiliar with that, it yes. is a black yes. horror film, and in it's like an anthology horror film. In one of the the, the scenes, there are these slave puppets that come to life, and it's the scariest shit that it, I will never, ever, 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 it ever, ever forget. It. Okay, imagine these. There's an artwork right on this person's house, and it has like this, you know, this 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 old woman, and there's these slaves around her, and these slaves come to life. And they become these little like puppet demon things and they start killing yo, I am getting scared. So when I saw the little <laughs> animated little thing, I was losing my mind. <laughs> I was like, this shit is so scary. Ugh. So yeah, that and but like I can imagine him being like that's essentially his his you know, his his conscious trying to scream out, what are you doing? You are he is becoming that puppet. And even someone points right. it out, it's like, you know, um, uh, she says a little bit later, like, whose puppet are you? That's the real question. Whose puppet are you? Because a lot of times, the things that we think we're doing, we don't think that our strings are being pulled. But when we really analyze like our actions and our decisions and stuff like that, we can get beside ourselves. Pierre had, for right or wrong, a decent you know, you know, goal of what he was doing at the beginning of the film. And he strayed so far from it to his, you know, his demise. I mean, and, and I, listen, and, and uh, listen, it, it should be that it got so far along because he's finally being recognized oh, because, because him, <laughs> him changing his name, his, him creating this persona and like this accent and all this to, to distinguish him from just being just another black guy. Mm-hmm. It didn't get him anywhere. Yeah. No. So like, it looks, like, it like, looks it, different, it, but he didn't get anywhere. You're right. Exactly. We, we, we can, we can 
relate this to today and say, okay, like just code switching. We all we mm. all code mm. switch. We even to the littlest degree we code switch. Yeah. I I I I go by Trey mm-hmm. because it's a gentler name on everyone's mind. Like and even and even in that smallest way, I go. I know I've got pla- gotten places because people know my name is Trey. Mm-hmm. So and so and and it's not like what you did. What you did in making that choice wasn't a, like it's not malicious, right? But it's sure, what we've not. had to do as Black America in order to try to get closer closer to having some fair or like just in this world right where we have to change our name to soften you know uh, the approach to some of our white counterparts like yeah that, we don't have that privilege like that's that is so tough like it's this film is so multi-layered because ultimately no matter what i mean you know uh, no matter how you know big you get the success you get your critical acclaim or anything to white America, the you're bad ones. And people like, like there's a difference. You're still a nigga, you know, right. um, like that, that's it. I, I think Paul Mooney told the joke or whatever. Um, he's like, you know, what do you call a, 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 a black millionaire? A nigga, you know? <laughs> and, um, and for folks that are listening to this podcast, that may have a sensitivity word, understand there's certain rules. All right. Uh, Trey may not say it. I say nigga a lot. Um, I know. I, I, I've said it a few times, and it's more yeah. than I ever have in my life. <laughs> but then also at the same time, it's like you know, I, I'm 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 one of those that like that word was used against us. We took it back, so we gonna do whatever we want. Don't say it. Don't you dare. Don't say it alone. No, no, no. I, <laughs> I, Don't you dare. I, I stand by this. I, you know, I stand so, by this. I, I absolutely stand by the idea. Yeah, and I'm fine for those that don't want to. I've taken that word back, so it can never be used against me. I, no. can I, let me let me let me ask you this, Caitlin. Let me yeah. and before we get right back into the movie, because I think we're we're just about done with the narration of this of the film. But I I could, I think it's important. I, I said this to my wife. Uh, I feel as though when I say black, I I do mean all minorities. I like for the most part. For, like don't get me wrong. There are very there's times where I don't mean all minorities, but <laughs> for the most part. I'm like, yo, if you are down, all, all, like, if you, if you are, uh, like, a Latin, if you are Chinese, if you're Japanese, like, whatever it is, you faced these same oppressions that, that we have. So yeah. when I say black, I don't, I, I in no way mean that because you are a minority that, that your struggles don't matter. I, I group us all in it together. All right, be careful that all mat- <laughs> be careful with that all lives matter shit. No, 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 no. I, no, no, I, I just to be clear, I did <laughs> not say that. I did not say that. <laughs> no, I, I, I exactly like I know what you mean. And sometimes some folks want to be so like so like specific with their words because people will try to latch on to whatever fits like their inevitable, and that's what they want to kind of latch on to, right? Um, when I say black, I specifically mean black, but what that doesn't mean is that I ignore all the other trials and tribulations that other minorities, especially in this country, have faced. Um, the black plight in America is something that I'm familiar with because I am black and I'm a man in America. I recognize my own privilege in that, yo, I've got it slightly better that I'm not a black woman in America because that's a whole True story. struggle. I, I have True it slightly better story. because I'm not a black gay man or a black trans man in America or a black trans woman in America. There's all these so varying true. degrees of struggle and what what makes us similar is that we all have struggle we are all but but at the same time i understand that i have a bit of privilege that others do and then i also contend that there is white privilege and white privilege is real right um we were brought to this country we built this country america has never been able to absolve itself from its original sin it did not abolish slavery it reformed slavery and if you don't think so look at the 13th amendment in the constitution it's very pointed right it says pretty much as long as you do not commit a crime, there will be no slavery. So what are we going to do? Do everything we can to make you commit a crime. Like that, that's it, right? Um, and that's not even a conversation really in this film, but that's something that these men and women have to deal with and can almost can be like just like what justifies some of those different actions. Because we don't have as much opportunity, Pierre says, this is what I need to do. You know what? I'm going to try to take you down. Damn, me trying to take you down, you've appropriated my black culture and have warped it into something completely different. And shit, I fell for it too. 
And that's the realization. Absolutely. That's what that's what's going on in Hollywood right now. That is the scary thing. So, you know, when we get Oscars so white, and some people don't understand it, like, oh, there's these black directors. 2018 was a great year for black cinema, right? We had um Black Klansman, <laughs> Black Panther. We had all the blacks. <laughs> we had I, blind. I, I, I laugh because that's probably that's probably the best. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Go on. Yeah, I and mean, also, you know, one of my favorite films of all time in um, at Beale Street to Talk. I mean, my brother got married. I, I think it's oh. Like, you don't understand how impressed hey. I was with Trey. Like I said, this, hey. this this is why he's my best friend. Like this man just <laughs> knows and gets it. Shout out to Nicholas Bertel. Um, my God. Um, but still, like it's 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 not enough, right? Um, and there's still so much work to be done. And I think the tide is changing a bit in this country. That is one. I think if this film was to able to be re-released right now. I think the impact would be so much greater than what it was 20 years ago. I mean, I, I, I would agree. I, I actually yeah, would agree. I that. mean, I, I <laughs> we, we didn't talk about like the technicals of the film. Is there great, you know, whatever the, the white standard is in regards to filmmaking practices done. I mean, it's a very grainy film. This looks rough, right? Um, it's not as appealing it's, as yeah. some other films. And so I will say in regards to the cinematography, did I love it? no, but it's not doing something bad. It's just doing, it's very two thousands in that respect. Um, me, I didn't always, yeah, exactly. love, I didn't always love the lighting. I think the performances, this isn't the type of film that you're going to go. Is that great acting? Because the goal of this film isn't to have like this big character journey. It's really to pick at all of the ails of our society. Like that's the goal from spike. So as a visionary, I like the direction. Um, I think the screenplay was good. Um, I think the performances were strong. Um, in regards to what they were asked to be able to do, I love the music and I love that interjection of like the documentary style. Like, I mean, bro, at the end, absolutely. Like, I cried at the end of this film. It, it is a, uh, it's, yeah. it's a fantastic ending. We in the show notes, we'll definitely have a link to that montage. You don't need to know. I, I mean, watch the film, but you don't need to know the film to know what what this this what three minute clip is is, and it's essentially a depiction of. Black Americans in in film, in this film is, and TV, is, and, and entertainment. History. This is American history, and um, you don't learn this in school at all. I, I mean, and you, like you see it online. Like there's, there's a clip with, with Judy Garland in blackface, and like you know this <laughs> Steamboat Willie. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, like like we we just see all different types of that. What actually got me really interested directly after watching this film is the history of Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I can't tell you why. I mean, I, I, well, I, I can tell you exactly why. Like the, the whole Mammy character who is in the movie as well. I kept looking at her and I go, man, I want some, I want some pancakes because I thought of Aunt Jemima. And then, and then I thought, is that racist? It's like, it, am I, am I, was I being fed like racist imagery and now I'm just relating this to syrup or whatever. It doesn't matter. The history of Aunt Jemima is for another time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh but listen you're bringing us you're bringing us home to whether or not this is required watching but let me let me just tell you something uh that i learned about the technicals of this film right so we're talking 2000 this is like two what three or maybe three years before we had the big shift to everything being hd mm -hmm. um as a standard but this was filmed on dv tapes that's it. You know what? It's very telling. Like I remember shooting my, oh, first, <laughs> shooting, my shooting my first indie feature, and granted, I shot it in two thousand five. My shit looked better than this. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's it's DV, it's multiple 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 DV cameras and the actual minstrel show and the commercials, which we haven't talked about. Um, oh my god! Were shot on. I think it was eight millimeter or sixteen millimeter cameras. So it's like everything. Hill, Hill nigger jeans. Um, <laughs> hilarious. Yo, hilarious. all the black commercials. I, I I do need to look up to, to see if, if they're available on YouTube because I mean, oh, they are. They, are. they will be in the show notes. <laughs> great. They are cultural appropriation at its finest. And for some folks, they wouldn't put it all together. Um, it's crazy to think that this was shot in 2000 and the 25th hour was done in 2002 and how starkly different both films look. I mean, first of all, 25th hour is a great film great film My, michael great film. Th that, that was michael rapaport's like best work 
Um, you know, he's had some really, really good stuff. But I mean, I mean, Ed Norton and oh, the goddess Rosario Dawson. Um, like, yeah, dude, Spike Lee has he's such a fantastic filmmaker. My goodness gracious! Um, <laughs> Again, he really is, and we don't talk about him nearly enough. We talk no. about it, like when we're talking when we're talking when we talk about filmmakers and films that we should watch when it comes to learning about film. We never mention Spike Lee. Yeah. We, like, it's, every, every, it, we make, everybody we, thinks that like literally the sentence starts with do the right thing and then like oh yeah he, yeah do you need to do the right thing right where was exactly that? you know i mean that's a film that came what that was 80 86 no 86. yeah so we forget we forget that his his first oscar was oscar was last is it last year or was it the year before i, I not too, it, yeah with all those together for me yeah, with with um, Black Panther. Um, it's crazy because you would think that he's does. a much more decorated individual, um, but not when it comes to like the Academy Awards, who isn't battled with so much systemic racism. But 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 do you know what that's about? I I, I think I truly think that's about he, he is often seen as an angry black man. Yeah, and and that and and that is not tolerated when we talk about the world of politics that surrounds getting any award. Not specifically the Oscars, but mm-hmm. to we all, we all know that to get to get any kind of award, you have to play be appreciative. And, yeah, be appreciative, right. and um, you know, and and play by our rules, right? So I mean, even when it comes to these protests, right? We tried peacefully protesting, that didn't work. Now we're angrily protesting. Oh, we want you guys. Just say you want us to protest the way that you want us to protest, right? Which is not protest at all. That's not what the, that's not what protest is, right? Because if that was the exactly. same instance, when you were trying to separate yourself from mon- from monarchy monarchy rule, right <laughs> back before the Revolutionary War, like, right, 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 the Boston Tea Party was not a civil protest. Lives were lost, folks. It was okay then, but it's not I mean, okay now. Like that's what the definition of protest is. And the thing is, we have so many grateful Negroes, right? Those are what we want. We want the yes sir, yes sir, master. Yep, oh, that's what we want. And think about how that was used inside this film. That's what the white man fetishes. And keep in mind, when I say white man, do if you take it personal, you got some white guilt. Don't take it personal. If you yourself have not done this or not like condoned it, don't take it personal. But just know that this is absolutely real. That this is what white America fetishes. A, a gentle, tolerant, not militant, non-combative black man. I mean, listen. I, I am. I, I'm gonna. <laughs> we're gonna go back to the film right after the sentence. But I, uh, like, I am six foot five, and in any occasion, you you see a six foot five, uh, like tall black person, black male, and that immediately means intimidation. That immediate, like, I ha- I make myself small in so many ways because I'm like I refuse to let anyone think I am intimidating to them because that can immediately escalate for me. And guess what? I can't change my height, so I have to figure out other ways to make myself seem harmless. Uh, but yeah, again, we have to play the roles that we are given, and when we rebel against them, it's a problem. Um, but to bring that back around to the film. It's just like uh, Pierre Delacroix. It's a problem because he gets sucked. He gets sucked into his own abilities to give in to what his bosses and the white people, <laughs> white people want, right? Uh, and it leads. I mean, there's a whole B story that we didn't get into, but uh, Sloane's brother, aka Jada Pinkett Smith, is a rap member. Uh, sorry, he's a member of a rap group, and. I don't even know who you would akin them to. Think Public Enemy, except no, Blestra. I, I actually don't even know who. To, who yeah, they it's it's, to. it's really interesting. I was trying to figure out who this would be. Like, it's not Wu Tang, right? Um, I, I don't know. It's 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 a bit it's a bit of a mixture of like protest group plus plus music group equal yeah. this equal the Mau Mau's. Yeah. Um, where they they're just upset, and I think they're just much more representative of the other group of black people who have to watch them mm-hmm. put on this menstrual show and get angry and not yeah. only get angry, but do something about it. And which, um, oh my gosh, yo, that I which, completely, I remember like seeing scenes from man, man bamboozled, like after it came out, but like, yeah. I did not remember that part. And I'm like, Oh wow. So, so <laughs> man, man Ray or man's hand who, uh, man's hand, who's played by Savion Glover, 
essentially falls out with everyone, you know, like, like it's his darkest, darkest, darkest moment. He is sick of it. He's sick, he's sick of performing because he has to sit there and put on the black face. And he's like, I'm not going to do that. He fell out with, uh, with Womack, his best friend, Jada Pinkett Smith is no longer his girl. Like he's done. And they throw him out of a taping of his own show, which is ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> where Mostef and the other members of the group are waiting. They capture him, and then they put they uh, they sent letters around saying that they were going to execute him online in a couple of days. And I thought a very funny line was because <laughs> it was I, I don't remember the exact line, but it was essentially that because everyone doesn't have access to the internet or because they don't have access to computers or whatever it was, that they were going to broadcast it live on air. Yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was really funny. And they, they did. They broadcast this execution where they made, they made Man Ray, uh, sorry, Man Ray slash Man Tan, uh, dance yet again. They're shooting at his feet. We've all seen this in cartoons. They're shooting, shooting, shooting at his feet. And he's dancing, doing his tap dance, and then they shoot him dead. And yeah, not just what? once, like Jada they shoot him several times. Oh, and four for zero reason. Yeah, overkill. Um, um, man, go on. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and, and the fact and seeing how Sloan reacts to it, and then one how the cops later catch up with the rap group, and they they arrest everybody but the white guy. Um, <laughs> great. Um, it is. Yeah, yeah. It's intense, and then to see how Sloan handles it, and then when she confronts Pierre, like how that all comes about. Like it, it's, it's like it's how that like that cycle of violence like goes right, where you feel this unjust done, and you feel like the only thing that you can do is respond with more violence. And I can't fault and it's- Sloan for doing that because like, that's that's. That's her right, and that's completely natural. And he accept he accepts it, and there's something so Shakespearean about all of this, right? Like this yeah. whole oh last. Gosh, yes. It's not the last. It's not the last act. Uh, it is the last act, but it's like the last like five minutes or so. It, it's so Shakespearean where he's like, he didn't say any of this, but he accepts his fate. Mm-hmm. He wipes her prints off the gun. She's lost her brother, her lover, her job. <laughs> Yeah. Like she's lost everything and obviously c- killed her boss. And for all intents and purposes, we don't know this for sure, but she gets off scot free, right? Yeah, and I mean, that's that's what we're led to believe, yeah. And Damon Wayne's just sat there bleeding to death. Um, and it ends with this three or four minute montage about how blacks are represented in media. And it's again, it's incredible. I I will link this in the show notes. It's something to be seen, just yeah. Um and thus the end of the film. And I think Stevie Wonder did an original song. I'm not, I know I know he plays a few times in the film. I'm not sure if it's original or not. Uh, remember when there was original soundtracks where like people made songs specifically for uh, for films? Yes. Um. It, it, yeah, it was a long time ago. Don't worry. It was. It was. <laughs> it was. Uh, <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, there we are. Uh, w- listen, at the end of the day, Kalen, as a filmmaker, as a filmmaker in any capacity, writer, director, or in between, is this film required watching? Oh, absolutely. Um, this is not only required um, being Black in America, but being an American and understanding where your place is in this narrative dissecting these elements the best you can and if you don't understand it be willing to create a dialogue with black people about it um and let that dialogue be a place from like you are in search of understanding and there should be expressed compassion civility um and empathy that's the only thing that we can do to try to let the stories that like like what we're seeing in this film really be successful so absolutely required watching. I, I completely agree. agree. It is required watching. And I, listen, for all the things that you said, I, I, think we, I think we touched on absolutely everything. I think the writing and the directing in this film are really important. I think, if, I think, I think writing about satire or writing a satire is an art form. I think we all attempt to do it 
but it's not always the greatest. <laughs> but I think being able to pull from your personal experiences and lend that to a satire is something that's always going to work. Uh, and I think this is absolutely for everyone. I mean, we, we talk about the Black experience because we are Black, but I, I don't want this. I don't want anyone to shy away from this film, matter, no matter what, you, what nationality or ethnicity you are. Um, and I, I implore people, I, I know we will talk about Spike Lee more, but I implore people to watch more of Spike Lee films and watch more of different kinds of films. This is why we exist here, is to look at films that we wouldn't typically look at and talk about them. Um, and before before I officially end this uh, episode, I just want to say that the on the sh- in the show and bamboozled, uh, there's the Alabama Porch Monkeys, <laughs> <laughs> which is a band, which is a, ba- a band that plays, and and that's the Roots, right? We yeah. like we know this, we know that that's the early Roots, roots. Which, I, <laughs> which I think is hilarious. Which I believe they at the time being... they were called the Nappy Roots. Is that right? Yeah, because remember they dropped the nappy from the name. Right, but were they? I, I didn't think there were still the nappy roots from uh, two thousand. Yeah, they. But, they but I, I mean, yeah. crazy. But I think <laughs> I think their evolution is something really interesting. Anyway, but but uh, but I think it's really interesting that I think five years later or whenever they like so many years later they end up joining Jimmy Fallon as their mm-hmm. band. Yeah. I am just going to leave that right there for everyone else to think about. I will not be saying anything (laughs) poorly about that. Uh, But listen, uh, I guess I guess that's our show. Kalen, let's let's wrap it up by by telling people where to find you exactly. Yo, brother, thank you so much, one, for having me on the pod. It's about time, and I cannot wait till uh, the next time. Folks out there, the only person allowed to call me Kalen is my brother. So that is it. Oh, is going back to the rest oh. of you. <laughs> nah, nah, you guys are good. Yo, you can follow your boy. I'm on all the socials, at Kobe Told Me on Twitter and Instagram. And if you're still into Facebook, I am there, at Kobe Mac. When I'm in the mood to write, you can check me my words out on ColbyToldMe.com. If you want to listen to me, catch my podcast, the Colby Told Me Podcast. And remember, when they ask you where you heard it from, just tell them Colby Told Me. Thank you. Colby Told Me, and this is Required Watching. Peace out. Peace. So that's our episode. I'm your host, Trey Epps. Uh, What did you think of the movie? Did I get it right or was I completely off base? Leave a message and we'll play it during our our next episode and discuss. Required Watching is a movie club, so as much as I'd love to hear my own voice, I would love to hear from you guys. There's a link in the show notes where you can leave a voice message or you can hit us up on Twitter and Instagram at Required Watch. See you there.